welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We're talking this hour with Mark Monchek, author of the book, Culture of Opportunity. Um, so when we just dropped off last segment, we were talking about millennials and kind of the importance on the workplace. Um, is your book for millennials or is it for other people? It, it's really for anybody that, that cares about um, having business be a driver of positive change, is anybody who cares about understanding the dynamics of change that are going on in the world and how it affects them and what they can do about it. Hmm. So it's for executives, it's for entrepreneurs, it's for social activists, nonprofit leaders, or anybody who works in a business and says, like, I want to be able to do better right. based on understanding what's happening in the world. Now, this concept of just the idea of business being a sort of an agent of positive change, I mean, that's a fairly new concept, relatively speaking. Uh, how did that even like come about that we could even think that way, which is a wonderful way to think? Well, if we go back to the golden age of American business, right? Mm -hmm. We started in the 1800s into the 1900s. Right. So you had companies like uh, U.S. Steel, and right. Carnegie, right. Uh, Rockefeller with um, Standard Oil, uh, Henry Ford with the Ford Motor Company. Right. Each of them had a very different understanding of what their purpose was in the world. So Andrew Carnegie uh, was a vicious union buster. He yeah. took um, resources out of the ground to mm -hmm. uh, create steel, uh, to build railroads. Mm -hmm. uh, his interest was in building great philanthropic institutions like the New York Public Library, right. like Carnegie Hall, right. um, you know, like, like Carnegie Mellon University. Right. So he had a sense of social good. Uh, his sense of social good was uh, we will be as profitable as we can be, and then once we're that profitable and powerful, then we'll give back. Right. Right? If you look at Henry Ford as an alternative, Henry Ford uh, priced the Model T, right, the first mm -hmm. American uh, consumer car. culture car yeah. at eight hundred dollars a car why because he wanted his own employees to be able to afford Ford it him. and he paid his line workers more than the industry standard because he understood that it was really creating a car for the middle class right. and building a large middle class that was going to create success for the Ford Motor Company. Right. Now, later on, he had union issues, and I, I'm not saying that Henry Ford was the ideal employer, but right. in, in a lot of ways, he embodied a very, very different approach than, let's say, did Carnegie or Rockefeller. Right. And then later on, you started seeing uh, you know, entrepreneurs in, in much later age, you know, Ben and Jerry's with, with Ben mm -hmm. and Jerry's ice cream, uh, hiring people from the community, uh, buying only organic milk from local farms in Vermont, right. uh, Richard Branson, you know, with yeah. the Virgin Group, and some of the companies that are around today that are actually in business to solve a social problem. So like Etsy, for example, um, you know, which is a mm -hmm. uh, retailer for people who have uh, home businesses as artists and artisans and mm -hmm. people, craftspeople, they wanted to create a market for people who could not start their own retail store, who lived in a rural area, right, or, or right. even indigenous people around the world who had mm -hmm. no way to sell their goods. So I think there is now a convergence of understanding that if business does not have a good purpose, does not uh, help in some way, mm -hmm. then it will no longer be sustainable over decades because uh, millennials won't want to work for that company. They want to buy mm -hmm. from that company. And when you mm -hmm. ask people, would they choose a company that's doing good over n any other company, 70% would if the price is about the same. Right. So as companies have been price competitive and as millennials have become much more educated and active in how they buy, we've started to see this shift happening over a couple of decades. Yeah. So for example, you can compare a company like Starbucks with a company like Dunkin' Donuts, right? Mm -hmm. So Starbucks started the trend of fair trade buying fair trade right. coffee, not the first, but the biggest by far, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. having organic coffee, um, paying their um, baristas and the people working in stores more than their competitors, giving their employees health care, mm -hmm. giving their employees stock options, even if they were part-time employees, mm -hmm. giving them educational benefits, and then giving their customers a place where they can go and work and study and right. hang out for the whole day and get right. Wi-Fi, right. even if they were just having one cup of coffee, coffee. right? Right. Whereas right. Dunkin' Donuts doesn't have that kind of culture. Right. Um, there have been a lot of lawsuits about Dunkin' Donuts franchisees suing Dunkin' Donuts for not honoring you know, their commitment to their right. uh, franchisees yeah. and yeah, yeah. so forth. So 
we have choices now that we didn't have before, right. right? And the more educated you are, you can decide that I'm not just voting every four years for president. I can literally vote hundreds of times a week right. for the companies that I buy from, where do I live, you know, who's my landlord, mm -hmm. uh, who do I work for, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Absolutely, yeah, we, who we do, do I go to for different services? Day, right? Yeah, 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 it's voting with your wallet yeah. is the most powerful form of voting that there is yeah. in a way. Um, in your, so your book is titled Culture of Opportunity. Why is it a culture? It's a culture to me because it's a way of thinking. It's a set of values. It's a sense that we are all in this together for a common purpose. Hmm. So if you look at a company that has really n does not have this connective culture, mm -hmm. right? Um, right. I'm, not, no, I'm not coming up with an example immediately, but let, let's say a, a company that doesn't really have these social values or the connectivity between their people. All right, let, let's, uh, let's say like some big pharmaceutical, like one of the big pharmaceuticals. Okay, so Pick anyone, it yeah, doesn't matter. So, so they, 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 they may have their own unique culture, right. but if their culture is not deeply embedded in caring about employees, customers, and communities, then that's not something that's going to get expressed in their level of sustainability. Right. So when things get tough, maybe their employees are going to leave. Maybe right. their customers are just waiting to buy from the next company because there's nothing about their company that creates any loyalty. Right. It's just, well, if your drug is cheaper, your drug is better, I'll buy from you. Right. But um, somebody comes out with a different type of drug, I'm going to buy from them. Right. So now we're seeing that in order to attract millennials and keep them working for you, mm -hmm. in order to have customers be loyal to you, right. in order for even investors to stick around for the long term. Right. Having a culture that embodies uh, positive values and has a, a, an intention to actually do good for those different key stakeholder groups like customers, mm -hmm. uh, communities, and employees, that's what creates a long-term ability to stay around in business and to uh, deal with the disruptions right. that, that come around. Right. Uh, Peter Drucker once said, one of his most famous quotes is, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. <laughs> so you could have the best strategy, yeah, and if you yeah. don't have a culture that will support that strategy, right. you won't have a strategy that will work, right? right? So if Peter were around today, I would tell him strategy and culture must eat lunch together. Mm, In other words, the culture right. itself it has to be in alignment. needs to be coming up with a strategy. Right. right. So in the old world of business, a handful of white men sat in a room with some market research from a relatively small percentage of customers, and right. they decided the fate of their company, and they would have a long-term 20-year plan and march toward that plan as if there was predictability in the world. Right. Okay? So now, in order to deal with the age of disruption, you have to get input from all the different people in your company and outside the company, right? The right. people who listen to the customers on the phone every day, the people who right. sweep the floors in the store, who see what's happening you know, on the ground in the store, right. uh, customers who are giving you feedback. You've got to listen to those customers, not just right. send out a customer survey, but actually right. talk to those customers, and when they respond to the survey, do something about the results right. of that survey. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I actually find, like, Nowadays, because technology makes it so easy, it's like almost every company I interact with wants me to fill out a survey afterwards yeah. at how it was working with their person. And I'm like, I don't have time for this. Any like in the beginning, I used to be really good about it, and I'd like to you know, give good ratings. But it's like now it's like everybody's doing it, and it's like I don't have time for this anymore. Um, but, but if they really wanted your feedback, rather than and you fill out a yeah. survey, when you call them up right. and you've got an issue on the phone right. and you give the feedback to the customer service representative, that's the time where they exactly. should be responding. Exactly. Okay. And that's like, and, and this in a way, it's kind of like whitewashing in a way where I see some companies where they have the mottos and the slogans and they, they talk like they're so customer focused and they're for the betterment of all this stuff, but then you actually interact with their customer service department and it's like uh, dealing with a robot because the only training the customer service rep has gotten is like reading through a database and they, they don't have the authority or the power or the knowledge to really help you. And it's like, 
you're telling me you're so customer focused yet I can't get a simple problem resolved? How customer focused is that? And I think a lot of people feel that way. And I'll give a, a perfect example of this. I, I, I needed to, to buy an appliance for an apartment and I went online, I found a really good price for it from a very well-known name retailer that's a very old retailer, has been around a long time. And I ordered it and um, it was being delivered to an apartment that uh, my mom owns for the tenant. And I, I checked in with them, I was like, did they deliver it yet? And they were like, no, I was like, that, that's weird. They're supposed to get, they said they would get back to you in like 24 to 48 hours after I ordered it and it never happened. And so uh, um, I said, okay, let's wait one more day. And then the guy calls me the next day. I got a call from them saying that we have to come pick it up. And I was like, no, I paid for shipping. What are you talking about? And I call up the guy and it's like, oh, our, we just found out our store is closing. We can't deliver anything. And uh, you have to pick it up by the end of the week or you, you lose your order. And I was like, I just put this order in last week. How come nobody told me the store was closing then that I would have to pick it up before I ordered it? And how come I didn't get a call 24 to 48 hours telling me right away? And, and it was just such an aggravated mess that to me it showed completely no regard for anybody at all. They were just like, let's dump this stuff, get it out as quickly as we can, and, and if you can't pick it up too bad, you lose your order. I was like, that's just ridiculous. And no wonder this company is going out of business. Yeah, and then on the other hand, you do see companies that actually the, the senior leaders do care about their customers. They do shop in their own stores to test. They actually talk to customers. Yeah. They walk the floor. They talk to employees. So, you know, there are companies like that. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Costco, but... Like yes, oh, like absolutely. Like yeah, Costco yeah. pays their, their employees better than average. They have better health care benefits. And you get a sense in the, in the store, you can feel that. I don't know if you, right. if you like Trader Joe's. I love Trader Joe's, right down the block down I, 72nd Street. I, I, I was once in line at Trader Joe's, and I said to him, just talking to myself, I said, oh, I forgot the scallions. So I hear the guy get on the PA system. Uh, produce gets scallions from uh, and bring it up to aisle six. And wow. so the guy brings me up. I'm like, I didn't even ask for it, but they, they actually care about you and they're very proactive. If, you, if you're walking right. around in uh, Trader Joe's and you look like you don't know where you're going yeah, or you're unhappy, you, they'll yeah. actually go up to you. It's like, can I help you, sir? Right. I feel like I'm on a cruise ship. That's yeah, how... Yeah, that's yeah. how um, and, and that's a culture. That's a culture. That's yeah. a culture because it's not just one employee, it's all of the employees and it's just the way the whole organization is run. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, believe it or not, it's time for us to take our last break of the show. So when we come back, um, we'll, we'll uh, tie it up with a couple of last little points from the book, and we'll let you know how you can get in touch with Mark. So everybody, please stay tuned. You're listening to The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, and we'll be right back. 